Hello, and welcome to this week's Quarren Tour, brought to you by Artist Bookhouse. This week, we're speaking with Jessica Spring of Springtide Press in Tacoma, Washington. Thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoy it. Again, welcome everyone to this week's Evanston Bound Quarren Tour brought to you by Artist Book House. We're so excited to be talking with Jessica Spring today. Jessica's coming to us all the way from Washington, the state of, not DC, in Tacoma. Jessica, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, I'm so happy to see your face. It's been so many years since you left Chicago. How long has it been? Uh, a long time, 16 oh. years. Wow, a long time. Yeah, that is a long time. Um, so what's the weather like there today? Just, you know, basic question to start us off. I'm not kidding. It's raining. Of course it is. Of course it is. Here in Evanston, it is 90 degrees, I think. 90 something. It is humid and hot and sticky outside. So we're glad to be inside for a little bit. But the sun is shining, so it's a good day. Yeah. Does it rain a lot there? You know, normally after the 4th of July, it's supposed to be nice. Okay. So usually we start our corn tours with the question, how did you come to the book arts? Um, I was a typesetter in college. I went to McAllister as an English major and worked on the paper. I started as a writer and I realized that if I was a typesetter, I got paid. So I worked as a typesetter, and then after college, I moved to O and got a job out in Deerfield. So I was commuting to this hideous job. Working as a graphic designer, um, partner in a graphic design firm, we did a lot of work for clients all over. Northwestern was one, Grolier Publishing, and... I was spending more and more time on the computer and really, really hating that. And finally looked at Columbia and thought, you know, I applied for the, the uh, scholarship and got it. And I was like, I'll try it for a year. How bad could this be? Um, and I was letterpress printing before I applied, but that was really a big turning point for me to be able to go there and kind of realize that there's a community of people and there's such a thing as artist books. You know, I, I was doing letterpress printing, but we were doing wedding invitations and explaining to clients why there was some value in having letterpress printing. And, you know, it was pre Martha Stewart, pre internet. So that was really, uh, it was kind of a crazy time. And at the same time, the computer, desktop publishing was exploding. So that, as that exploded, I kind of ran away from it, if that makes sense. That does make sense. And also what strikes me on a piece that you just said is that it was pre-Martha Stewart and you had to explain to people the value of letterpress. Can you go a little bit more in depth on that and why people at that time maybe didn't recognize the craft as something valuable or lovely? Well, they didn't know what it was, you know, any, any letterpress job that you did, you had to explain, here's, here's the impression in the paper and here's why you'd want this. And here's why you'd want to pay us um, to hand set this work. And it was a huge part of the job was just convincing people. But the other aspect of it is that we did keepsakes, you know, letterpress Valentine's every year. And so being able to do that was just a way to promote the business and show something unique and, and keep my interest, frankly. And just be beautiful pieces of art working in amongst themselves. They'll have those old pieces. Yeah, a lot of them. Let's go back to Columbia for a minute. What were your primary interests at Columbia and what did you focus on at Columbia? Was it strictly letterpress or was it all three disciplines? Did you think about 
artist books more? And did that expand your thinking? Did you do performance? You know, at the time I was required to do two performance classes and I was always really sort of embittered about that because I was like the performance kids don't have to print or do book binding. So I also thought that was kind of baloney, but I made it through and I was talking to Ken, the puppetry class was the thing that made it possible because we were behind a screen and I have some skills making animal noises. So <laughs> so you focused on your performance as puppets. Yes. Yeah. Have a layer between you and the audience as well. Right. I wish we could have made the performance people make books. That would have been even more interdisciplinary and lovely. That's a good point. I never thought of that. Oh, I thought about it a lot. And I always felt it was like a one-way highway with that. So... Well, I have to be uh, completely frank with you. I was in group one, so we were the guinea pigs, and we had to have combined performance and sound classes. So we had page and stage, where we wrote and performed, and then the next semester we had sound and movement, where we did sound pieces and did movement. And we personally loved those, but we also thought there's no way to go in-depth on either one. So I guess it changed after after my group, because they sort of listened to us, but then it made it kind of different for your groups because you couldn't experience both. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what direction it went, but probably I didn't help the cause for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we would have to check in with some of our later graduates to see how they felt later. Um, But different topic, different time. Uh, Let's walk through what happened when you left Chicago. Well, we had the opportunity to move out here. And the best part was I had a shop in Chicago. My studio mate, by the time I left, was Barry Zaki. She still has a store in Lincoln Park, I think. So we had the chance to move. The company that hired my husband agreed to move my shop. I, you know, he was like, well, my, my wife's an artist. She's got a studio. Can you move her? And I think they thought like I was a watercolor painter or something. And, you know, a, a curtain truck later, shit tons of metal all came to Washington state. Vandercooks. Yeah. That is incredible that they did that for you. That saved you thousands and thousands of dollars incredible is right so we came out here and I had the opportunity to start teaching at Pacific Lutheran it's a small private college and the person who um, had taught there for years Megan Benton was retiring and just by weird fluke um, I got to meet her and started teaching there and I did for 16 years and just actually retired this year oh that's fantastic And so you have your shop, you have your teaching, you have your joy, you have your family, you have Washington weather, everything great, what wonderful sunshine and rain, all the things. So for folks who aren't letterpress printers, forgive me, this is going to be in alphabetical order by the way of the, the typecase. All right. So pay attention. I make artist books, as we talked about, and I'd like to include this description in this talk so that people kind of, there's a lot of ways to describe what an artist book is. And I definitely sort of interpret it very loosely, but I'm in favor of calling on all the senses if possible. To me, the best book hits them all. If you can, sound, I think is really hard to taste. I haven't had much success with that. And I like to take content and structures that really engage the reader. To me, that's the real challenge of making a successful artist book. This is one that hit four of those spots. It opens and closes and makes a sound, which I didn't know when I made it. That was like an extra awesome bonus. Um, It's a type specimen of a lot of the bees that are in my shop. The covers are velour. So when you feel it, it feels kind of like a bee. It's called a honey beehive. And it happened after I got stung by a bee outside the shop. And it just like inspired the idea. People ask, you know, how do you, how do you think of your books? Often there's some weird 
thing that happens that inspires it. But that's what made this happen. And I love the idea. Often I incorporate typography. And I like the idea of reinterpreting what a type specimen is. I'm very interested in typographic composition. And the more unusual things I can do, the better. I like to look at historic examples of really, really intense composition that breaks the X and Y axis. And these are some examples of setting type in a circle. And that's something that I've been doing for a while. And I started calling it daredevil typesetting and actually invented this furniture that lets people set type in circles and lock it up in a press, especially on a platen press. And so that idea that I came up with has been sort of a side business. So I sell this furniture to printers around the country and overseas, which is kind of cool. So can you talk about locking up on the press and what furniture is and what it does? Absolutely. So the very quick and dirty explanation, um, letterpress printing is printing from a raised surface. So it could be wood type, metal type. Um, and the trick for a printer is to be able to take that type, lock it up, and furniture, typically made of wood or metal, serves the purpose of holding that type in place. And for some presses, I mentioned the platen press or the clamshell press, it has this kind of action. And so you need to actually lock the type up into a chase, defy gravity and have that printing happen. Uh, I've got some photos later that I can show of platen presses. So the furniture holds things in and helps it defy gravity. All right, we're on D, we are moving on. Uh, ephemera is one of my favorite all-time things. I love to print it, I love to collect it. It's kind of a sickness. So for those people who do not have their dictionaries handy, could you give us your definition of ephemera? Typically, it is material that is ephemeral. It's not around for a very long time. Some great examples are business cards, matchbook covers, stickers, anything like that, stamps. People collect because especially the older examples are really exquisite. Calling cards cigarette cards. So I often incorporate those in my work just because it's so appealing to me. And the, the ephemeral nature of it is appealing too. And it makes sense. We do so much work on paper that I love that substrate. I love how fragile it is, but also how strong it can be. The other project that I've been doing since 2008 is called The Dead Feminist, and it's a project that I collaborate with illustrator Chandler O'Leary, and that has a separate website, thedeadfeminist.com, and we did a book a few years ago. Ida B. Wells is the newest dead feminist. She's the 30th. So we take quotes from women throughout history who are dead. That's part of the deal. And we pair them with social justice issues. So over the years, we've done 30 of them. They're kind of riotous color. And Chandler draws all of them hand-lettered. The only thing that is digital is the colophon. She draws them. Um, and then I print from photopolymer, which is a plastic material. I would describe it as digital letterpress. So it kind of marries the hand drawing with the press so that I can actually print Chandler's illustrations. And that's been, that been going on since 2008. And our website has a lot more information. That's like a whole nother talk, but. How big are these? The prints are 10 by 18. This is a series. How many do you produce each year? Typically two. We're on G. This guy is Roy G. Biv. He is a print from my latest book called Memory Lame. And I love puns. I can't help it. I love hobo. So this print kind of has all of the things. And the book Memory Lame is about loss of memory. And it was really inspired first by losing my dad to Alzheimer's and then having some memory challenges myself. And so I 
I did this book and then incorporate a poem called Forgetfulness by Billy Collins. Horsepower is a book about, I love words, obviously. And so I collected a lot of words inspired in the English language from horses and our history with horses. Terms like ponytail or full of beans. And I had the idea to take this American girl doll horse and I made paper with horse hair inclusions and printed all of those words and a timeline of history about how horses are part of our history and how important the domestication of horses really supported human life. And I had the idea to put the book in between the horse and just thought like, oh, I'll cut it apart and it'll stand up, piece of cake, but realized finally that I really had to have a base for the horse to stand on. So yeah, math is not my strong suit. So how many of these are there in existence? There's only one. This is the thoroughbred edition, but then I did 15 more that are actually bound with like a horseshoe cover and just the inside of the book. Okay, so this is the single one that shows it off in its most extended way. Nice. I love this. So this horse lives on Bainbridge Island at the museum there, and they've agreed to feed it and water it. Ingrained is, again, I love using found objects. This was a commission for the City of Tacoma's Community Fund. And so I took, this is a, a sales kit. So the guy would come to your door and show you different shingles that you could purchase. I took off the old sales text and replaced with handmade paper from Western Red Cedar text that I wrote about the forest kind of compared to the community. And so it's handmade paper that I just did in the yard here and dried on the garage window it worked out pretty well. And then, like I said, I wrote the text and here's an example of some of the typesetting that I did that sort of undulates on that handmade paper. This is a recent print I just finished and postcards. If anybody wants some, I'm happy to mail them out. Trying to work through what's going on since the pandemic and deal all these questions of race and trying to get some printing done because the power of the press always kind of makes you feel better. It's very therapeutic. L, we're on L. Uh, I had to print this after I heard one too many people say, you know, isn't letterpress printing a dying trade? I was like, here's the answer to that. So boom. And it's using cr beautiful chromatic wood type from virgin wood type so it is two colors and they overlay to create this third color it's just gorgeous to work with this is a detail for memory lame the book that i mentioned the inside of it is called a memory palace and i've got a in the video showing you some more details of this so like the horsepower book this one is um, about terms we get from the traditions of sailing. So it's a flag book structure. Those are vintage cigarette cards. And I could not bear to glue them down and ruin them. So I came up with this sewing structure that kind of looks like fishnet. And then you can tuck the cards in and they still are okay. They aren't ruined. This is an edition of seven. There's one at Northwestern and they're named after the seven seas. This is a artist book about homelessness, handmade abaca paper. I printed on the inside of the paper or the inside of the houses ornaments. So they sort of shine through with the color and the haikus are one for each season. This is a collaboration with a poet that I did. Um, this is the craziest book. We moved here to Tacoma, as you guys know. And up in the attic, there was a box of glass negatives, over 200 of them from the 1890s. And these beautiful images were on them. The ones that you can see in the front there are pictures of travels. So think of 1890 people going to Hawaii, Niagara Falls, Boston. There's some images from Tacoma, actually my own street 
and buildings that were in existence in the 1890s. So I'm brand new to Tacoma. I'm like, I don't even know what these images are. So I had to spend a ton of time researching them. So they are um, inkjet printed on Abaca coded so that you can see through them to sort of talk about the original slides. And, and then the text on the center panels form this sort of crossroads, right? Because Tacoma is at the time in 1890, not really a frontier town anymore. And they're starting to have this um, sort of leisure class that was a new thing at the time. So there's actually pictures of women who are fishing and boating. And the whole piece sort of talks about that moment in time and the other things that were going on in Tacoma then. Really cool opportunity to like get up to speed on the history of the Pacific Northwest and Tacoma specifically, and then to work with these incredible photographs. And it's still kind of a mystery who took them, but it was a really fun project that took several years. Can you talk a little bit of technical for a moment as to... They're abaca. They're sandwiched here like slide. And then you coated the abaca with what after you did the prints? So first I had the inkjet coat it to print the images. And then they were treated with mineral oil, cleaned off to increase the transparency. And then the structure in the middle, what is that made from? It's all two-ply museum board, and then those are sandwiched, so it all folds down into a box, actually. There's four chapters, and then the hinges are also made with abaca, so it, it can collapse pretty easily. How many copies in this edition? 24. There's one at Northwestern. So going back to typesetting, circular quads, I can define those in the image. They're sort of these stair-stepped shapes, and they were the traditional way that people would set circle or curved type. And then below that is my sort of dumbed-down circular quads that are part of the daredevil furniture. So part of my sort of inspiration and in kind of inventing this furniture was like, people can't get the circular quads anymore. They're pretty rare. So how can we kind of make that happen for people nowadays? And then on the right hand side, those are line formers and they're really simple brass rule and they have little sort of clamps at the end so those allow one to set type in waves or curves and the problem then is like how to lock that up but it's really rare to see these so it was super fun to find them and actually work with them. And it's super inventive that you now have this side business of putting these extra pieces of furniture out there. This is an example of some work. I've been trying to do more sort of installation work. And so I had an opportunity a couple summers ago to go to Basel and work for a couple weeks. It was two weeks and I printed on the biggest Vandercook I've ever printed on. It was amazing. I could barely barely reached my arms across to lift the rollers out to clean the press. And there's like three pedals to operate it. But it was fun as all get out. I love machinery. So it was like such a cool challenge. Plus I could print really big. So the finished pieces don't look that big, but um, to create that sort of fan shape, it had to start out as a really big sheet. So there's two different sizes and the text that's embedded or hidden in there say, say echo and fold, and then they were hanging. So we did all this in, in two weeks, lots of printmakers. They were mostly like real printmakers and I was a book artist. So it was a, a fun challenge. Did you make this paper or was it purchased? It was paper that they had on hand. It was some very um, beautiful vintage Japanese paper and I was able to buy it from the studio there and just used it. It worked out really well. I love that. It's just lovely and I imagine these are very floaty objects. Yeah, they are. They're pretty lightweight. The biggest challenge is what was getting it back home, but I've been able to show it a couple other places. So that's cool. So this is my shop here in Tacoma. 
And I actually have a quick little tour for you guys that I will narrate, and that's going to be on the next slide. But you can see on the bottom right, we talked about platen presses. So that's one there. And then the Vandercooks, you can see in the back corner, both of those kids came from Chicago. And let's do the tour. Okay. So as you enter the shop, I've put a, a beautiful printer's fist in the floor and it says enter. So we're walking in. This is a cabinet full of tiny ornaments. You can see some of the detail there. I use them all the time and so many fit in there. It's amazing. Type saw, closet full of junk, stairs to upstairs. And there's the big view of the shop as we come in. And perforator. I love making stamps. So that's some gum paper. And this big uh, door lifts so that a forklift can drive in and bring the presses in. Some big wood type up top. And this is a copy of Memory Lame, the book that I was talking about before. Um, and you can see the center memory palace and there's Roy G. Biv. And then Forgetfulness, the poem I mentioned by Billy Collins. And then as we walk down the table, these are the dead feminist prints, two recent ones that are actual size. Um, here's some more dare, dare, daredevil typesetting. That's Beatrice Ward's Goblet and some beautiful type from my collection, daredevil furniture locked up there on the big cutter and my little guillotine a spider. <laughs> and this is where I'm sitting right now talking to you guys. Work from many, many friends, including some from Chicago, hanging up on the line there. There's the Vandercooks. This was prep for a class I did through the School of Visual Concepts. It was kind of a um, crazy cooking show. This is a broadside that I completed um, for Bill Stewart using the donut holes from the Daredevil furniture. There's all kinds of ink. I have a couple little sig waltz that I take for demos and I love the beautiful ornate painting on the sides. A little slug cutter, Crisco for cleaning. There's a better shot of the platen press. And I do have a lot of type, it's true, um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. There's some other tools um, where I mix ink on glass, a lot of furniture, which we talked about, reglet. This is a composing stone and some postcards that I've been making for the pandemic to mm -hmm. mail out to folks who want them. And we're going down, there's one more aisle of type here and a really big manicule or printer's fist as we go down the aisle. Some of the detailed pieces from Memory Lame that still need to be put away. Bad, bad, Jessica. Some sexy wood type because we have to do that. And more type, lots more type insane amounts of type. It's all labeled, um, but not as organized as it should be. So that's an ongoing task. And we're circling back to the window where we came in. More really, really big type. That's a new acquisition. And back to memory lane. All right. All right, we're back to, uh, we're gonna finish up the alphabet here. We are on S. Um, this is Saddle Up Sugar. I had the chance to go to the Morgan for a residency. Highly recommended. They have insanely huge wood type there. Um, this S filled up the whole press bed and it was such a joy to print. Um, and then I curved that type for uh, Saddle Up Sugar underneath this really cool cut I found there. Um, I went to make paper, but of course I had to do some printing. Uh, I mentioned that I 
taught at Pacific Lutheran. This is a shot of a collection that we um, were given while I was working there called the Thornley Collection of Antique Type. It is incredibly stunning. Some of the most beautiful ornate type that you'd ever want to see. So my responsibility while I was there was to set up the shop. There were over 40 cabinets full of this type. Um, and it was a lot of work to bring it in, but really cool that students actually got to use it. Um, when I did teach, we mostly worked on platen presses, which is kind of unusual. I think a lot of schools feel like they're too dangerous. Um, for students to use. And I'm really proud of the fact that um, I have a good track record, no, no lost fingers of any students. And um, they, while I was there, created type specimens from that Thornley collection, which is pretty cool. So these students are using type from, you know, 19, 19th century. Um, this is called typeface and some craziness with type in my collection, mostly black letter. And I really liked this text and had this image cut to kind of play with the faces and bases. This is a print that I did um, for Ham at 20. I, I know other printers here have participated and um, this is some wood type from my collection that I felt like was appropriate um, to share with Hamilton fans. And I set type and ornaments in that circle shape to sort of make reference to uh, the tree cut. Xenagogy X um, is another book that kind of followed the B book that I showed you guys earlier, uh, a, another idea of a type specimen. And this structure I called the Excordian, and it was printed at John Horn shop. Uh, he invited a few printers there for a week, and he has probably more wood type than anybody in the world. And so I focused on using X's in his collection and words that start with X to talk about xenagogy as a guidebook and to talk about um, xenophobia and other X words that are really pertinent right now. And I also included a what we call a type twofer. Often X's were used when printers ran out of letters or they needed a surface to carve they would flip the X over because it was the least used letter. And in this case, this X had this image on the back, um, but often they'll carve a missing letter. So I, I love these two furs and there are some really cool ones I found at John Horns. So the X accordion, um, again, like the B book folds flat, but opens up to show several X's. I don't have a great picture of it here. Thank you all for listening to this. That's my, this is my thank you time. Um, this is glow in the dark ink, which I um, have used a few times. And what I can tell you about it is you will wake up in the middle of the night and look at your cuticles and see that they are glowing. That's what happens when you use glow in the dark ink. So I probably lost a few years of life. This is um, handmade paper I made at Helen Hebert's and it was super great to print on, like really lofty and delicious. I do work with other artists here in Tacoma. Suzanne Moore um, is a renowned lettering artist, calligrapher. She worked on the St. John's Bible and she lived a ferry ride away over on Vashon Island and she actually just her and her husband moved to Arizona, but this is her book called Zero that I got to print with her, which was, I learned a ton and it was super fun to collaborate with her. Um, Jack is my dad and also my son. And this is a project that I did uh, with my dad before he died. I mentioned he had Alzheimer's and he was an ephemera collector. So these are milk bottle caps that he, would ride with the, the milk 
delivery guy and he would get paid in bottle caps and he thought that was just the coolest thing. So I ended up with my dad's collections, matchbook covers, milk bottle caps, and he would come to the shop and we'd sort them. And even though his memory was failing, it was like working and touching these objects brought these memories back. So um, together, with his help sorting, I put on an exhibit at our local post office at downtown and showed all of his crazy collections and some of mine too. So this is this little museum and I absolutely loved it. And he um, came to see it and just was so charmed and kept remembering um, when he couldn't remember the most basic things, he would remember that I was working on this and love to chat about it so and i love that this is in a not normal gallery space because it probably charmed a lot of people coming to the post office right it was a stamp museum so it was it was just perfect i love that so we for for folks who don't know type cases j and u we're on u is at the end um and so this is one of the matchbook covers. So part of the show is I took some of my dad's collection, uh, enlarged them 400%. So milk bottle caps and matchbook covers. And in this case, I love that, that really bad registration on the original, but I couldn't quite bring myself to um, print it that badly myself. So I... I it a little bit. Can you describe what registration is for the few people on here that have never printed on a letterpress? And sure. talk about why it's the bad registration on the matchbook cover and why it was so hard for you not to print that way. <laughs> registration is the layering of multiple colors together to get them printed, right? And in some cases, like blending cyan, yellow, magenta, and black, you can create any color, right? In this example, you can see where like the brown on the dog's ears is just misregistered. It's kind of going outside the lines. And so that's just not perfect printing. And as printers, we like to register colors correctly. But part of the charm of a lot of this vintage ephemera is that it's poorly registered and sort of quirky. So with the matchbook cover I did, I, I tried to fix it a little bit. And I also decided that rival dog food did not write a very good, they weren't good copywriters. And like, obviously the text should read unrivaled, not give me rival dog food, arf, arf. So I had to make that change too. So in your life, these years later, as a printer, you're also still editing and type and being a copywriter. Absolutely. But that's, Absolutely. that's arts, right? We get to do all that. We have control over all of it. Um, so that is it. And here's info for my website and um, Instagram. I'm not on Facebook, but Dead Feminist is on Instagram too. And I think this is ephemera I found in Evanston at this antique store, maybe in Rogers Park. And I loved it. It's probably for a dry cleaners, but I was like, oh, it's perfect for me too. Thank you so much for this. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Corn Tour, brought to you by Artist Bookhouse. We had such a good time speaking with Jessica Spring, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you'd like to donate to our musician fund or to support programming like this, please visit our website at www.artistbookhouse.org. donate You can also find previous Corn Tours on our website and on our YouTube channel. Take a chance, subscribe, we'll see you soon.